Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to Savvy Central Radio. This is your host, Christina Nitschman. Each week on Savvy, we host new individuals and business owners, inviting them to share their expertise, dreams, and lessons learned in their field of business. Our guest today is Bob Berg. Bob is a sought-after speaker at corporate conventions and entrepreneurial events. He regularly addresses audiences ranging in size from 50 to 16,000, sharing the platform with notables including today's top thought leaders, broadcast personalities, Olympic athletes, and political leaders including a former United States president. Although for years he is best known for his book Endless Referrals, over the past few years, his business parable, The Go-Giver, co-authored with John David Mann, has captured the hearts and imagination of his readers. To find out more about Bob, you can go to his website at www.berg.com. That is B-U-R-G dot com. Hi, Bob. Thanks for coming to Savvy Central Radio. How are you? Great, Christina. So great to be with you today. Well, I'm really, really excited. I'm so glad that our very good friend, Lisa Menini, got us in contact with each other. And you told me all about your awesome book, The Go-Giver. I loved it because we were just talking about the wonderful topic of giving and how often in business we often feel like to give means we're going to lose. And so you put together an awesome story to demonstrate how this is actually not true in a wonderful parable called The Go-Giver. So can we start by telling the audience a little bit about the premise of your book? Sure. And, and I love Lisa Manini. She's great. And I'm, I'm grateful to her for uh, connecting us. The, the go-giver itself is it's a, a brief parable, so a fictional story uh, with a, a business. And, and I would like to think Life Lesson. It was co-authored with a, a wonderful, terrific writer by the name of John David Mann, who was really the lead writer and storyteller. I'm much more of a how-to type. Uh, John's a a great weaver of the story, and so it worked out well. And the, the basic premise is simply that shifting one's focus, and this is really the key, focus, shifting one's focus from getting to giving. And when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing value to others. And that doing so is not only a, a nice way to live life, but a very financially profitable way as well. It's good business. And what came through to me is that it seemed to be saying nice gals and girls finish first. Well, it seems like a nice idea. Is it a little bit naive to think that or not? No, it would be very naive to think that if that was the main message, but it, it's not. And now here's the thing. When someone hasn't read the book and maybe they see a title like The Go-Giver <laughs> based on the messages that they you know, that we get from society and so forth, it might appear as though the basic message is that, hey, you know, just be nice and, and great, just give yourself away and good things will happen. And, and that's not the message at all. It's not realistic. And uh, let's put it this way. Being nice is a great thing, both for its own sake and it's also, again, good business. When you're nice, and when I say nice, I mean genuinely kind, uh, mm -hmm. using the words interchangeably in this case. People are more attracted to you. People are more likely to want to do business with you and get to know you, and that's fine. So being nice is actually very helpful, very important, but it's not enough to be successful. You and I and everyone listening to this, we all know plenty of people who we would most likely describe as being simply nice people who we would also have to describe as being simply broke people. Mm. Again, while nice is important in and of itself, it's not enough to be successful. Success is also a matter of doing the correct things in the success process that allows a person to be successful and finish first, if you will. And the five laws that John and I provide in the book are simply meant to, to share those principles. And if someone will utilize them, all five of them together in conjunction, not one, two, three, or even four of them, but all five, they must be successful at what they're attempting. Mm. I love what you're mentioning here, and I can really see the, the difference of what you're saying as well. Because I have a good many friends who are super nice, but to nice to the point where they get stepped over and used. And, and that's 
not good business. I mean, you want to be able to add value to people's lives, give to them, but not allow yourselves to be taken advantage of. There is a line. So anyone who does think, hey, a go-giver means just giving to your heart bleeds and no value for yourself. Well, you can't give to others if you have nothing to give, if you've depleted yourself, in other words. That's very true. I mean, you might be a giver, but you're not a go-giver because you're not following all five laws, two of which are compensation and receptivity. So I'm, I'm excited to hear about that. Tell us about the principles and the five laws, as you call them, the five laws of stratospheric success. The, we were going to call them the five laws of ordinary, mediocre, boring, and unexciting success, but we didn't think <laughs> that was as well. No, this definitely sounds a lot better. <laughs> and so the five laws themselves are the laws of value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and receptivity. The, the first law the law of value is really the foundational law or foundational principle. It's what everything else is built on. And the law of value, Christina, simply says that your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. Now, when you first hear this, it sounds kind of counterproductive. It's definitely counterintuitive because it in a sense, it sounds like a recipe for bankruptcy when you first hear it. I mean, how do you give more in value than you take in payment and stay in business at all, never mind thrive? Mm -hmm. And so we, we simply have to understand the difference between price and value. Mm -hmm. Price is a dollar figure. It's a dollar amount. It's finite. It simply is what it is. Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing to the end user or beholder. In other words, mm -hmm. what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea that brings with it so much worth or value that someone will willingly exchange their money for it and be glad they did mm -hmm. while you still make a very healthy profit? May I share a quick example? Go for it, yes. Just on a very basic level, let's say you were to hire an accountant to do your taxes and she charged you $1,000 and that's her fee, literally, or, or her price. But what value does she give you in exchange for this $1,000 price? Well, she, by her excellence, by listening to you with attention and, and uh, with empathy and making sure to understand what it is you're looking to do and looking to accomplish by really studying your business, she is able to save you $5,000. Mm -hmm. He also saves you countless hours of time, freeing you up to do what, what's more productive or more joyful. She also provides you with the peace of mind and security of knowing it was done correctly. So we see here that value can be both concrete in terms of the $5,000, mm -hmm. but also intangible in terms of the peace of mind. And so what she did was, uh, again, on a very basic level, she gave you well over $5,000 in value or use value in exchange for a $1,000 price or cash value. So you come away from this feeling absolutely terrific, mm -hmm. and she makes a very healthy profit, which she should. And that's the kind of result we want to see with anyone with whom we do business. We want to give them such a unique, exceptional, and wonderful buying experience that they come away from it, you know, feeling wonderful, and we make a very healthy profit. This goes back to what we talked about earlier, and that is focus. See, if your focus is on the money, they're going to sense that you're not going to be as effective. They're not going to find it to be of value, and you're probably not going to do business with that person. If they can tell, though, and they usually can, that your focus is unabridgedly and laser on providing value to them, they're going to feel good about you. They're going to trust you. They're going to have faith in what you can do, and that exchange will take place. This is why John and I say that money is an echo of value. It's the thunder to values lightning, if you will, which simply means the value must come first. And the money is simply a natural and direct result of the value you've provided. Mm, I love, love, love that, Bob. And this recalls to me a good friend I have who has a tangible product, which doesn't cost that much. It's only it's a T-shirt. So people buy T-shirt from him, and you think, what's the big deal? It's just a T-shirt off the hanger. What could possibly be that amazing about a T-shirt? 
Well, he has made an art out of selling t-shirts. He, when he packs them up, very much like he, what's it called, uh, Tiffany and Company, he gets really nice tissue paper. He wraps it up in a pretty box that has the logo on it. I mean, he makes it so special that when you open up your t-shirt, you feel like you've actually gone to something like a Tiffany and Company to get your t-shirt. And he's actually gotten people saying, not only is the t-shirt wrapped really nice and special, but I feel I got special treatment. The quality of the t-shirt is bar none to any I've ever bought. So it goes to show that even if your product or service doesn't cost a lot in monetarily funds, you can buy the very experience you give people, the value you give them, the whole experience can equate the value. It doesn't have to be the necessary um, dollar factor. And that's a great point because, again, while there's intrinsic value in the t-shirt, mm-hmm. what he's done is he's provided an experience for that person. Exactly. And that's the key. And what we find is when it comes to providing value and communicating value, it's more than just the commodity itself that makes a difference. You've got to be that extra value, and that's what he's doing. And value can typically be communicated, well, probably hundreds of ways, Christina, but they tend to fall under five what we call elements of value. Mm. Those are excellence, consistency, attention, empathy, and appreciation. And to the degree that you can use one or more of those, that's the degree you're going to communicate value. His, aside from excellence, is really the attention to detail. He makes it special for them. Mm, He does and certainly does. Wow. Well, that's awesome. What would be the next law on the list? I see here it's the law of compensation. What exactly is that? This says that your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says to give more in value than you take in payment, law number two tells us that the more people whose lives you add this kind of exceptional value to, the more money with which you'll be rewarded. Your accountant in the first example did a great job of giving you more in value than she took in payment. So if you're her client, the chances are you feel good about her, you feel great about her, Mm -hmm. Uh, you would do business with her again, and most likely you would refer her to others. Well, if you feel that way, the chances are her other clients feel the same way. So our accountant is very quickly amassing what we call an army of personal walking ambassadors, people out there singing her praises. And as she continues to add this exceptional value to the lives of more and more people, her income will continue to grow and grow. So the big lesson with this law is, and in the story, Mm -hmm. Nicole Martin, the CEO, told Joe, the protege of the story, that law number one, the law of value, as important as it is, that represents only your potential income. Mm. Law number two, the number of people whose lives you impact with that value, that represents your actual income. So we can almost combine laws one and two and say that exceptional value plus significant reach Mm -hmm. equals very high compensation. And that seems to fall into the third one, which is the law of influence, which would probably bring you number two or increase number two for you. Yeah, well, the law of influence says that your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Again, you know, this one sounds counterproductive at best, perhaps even downright Pollyanna-ish at worst. And yet, you know, you look at it, all the great leaders, the top influencers, the most financially successful salespeople, this is simply how they conduct their businesses and how they run their lives. They're always looking for ways to bring value to others. As one of my mentors, Harry Brown, put it, in a free market-based economy, profit is simply a, a reward for satisfying the desires of others. And to do that, you've got to place their interests first. Mm. By the way, and this is very important to, I guess, clarify or qualify, that when we say place other people's interests first, we certainly don't mean that you should ever be anybody's doormat or a martyr or self-sacrificial in any way, not one single bit. It's simply as one of the other mentors in the story, Sam, told Joe, the protege, the golden rule of business is that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. And there's no faster, 
more powerful or more effective way to elicit those feelings toward you and others than by what we would call stepping outside yourself, moving from an I focus or a me focus to an other focus, looking for ways to be an asset of value to others. And this is just the topic or just where me and Lisa were on the topic of when she brought your name up because we were talking about how when I first got started in business and I ended up going to networking event after networking event and we were all new business owners and we all had in our mind we have to get our business out there. We have to get people to pick us up and buy our stuff. And it was all about a me, me, me focus. And we all had dismal results and felt rather frustrated because it was, you know, pass your card out and call me up and, you know, get a million cards, come home and sit there and don't know anyone. And we realized that, you know, we were talking, we said without building that real connection to someone and really making them first and not making, I must get this sale first, we were actually hurting ourselves and not going forward. Exactly. Well, but the thing is, you're wise enough to see that and do a course correction. Mm. And, and again, it, when people say, well, but I, what if I really, really need the money? Well, then that's even more reason to find ways to be of value to others. Because remember, and, and you know, this was Joe's problem in the book when it started. Mm -hmm. Nobody, and I say this to my audiences, nobody is going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet. Exactly. You know, they're going to buy because they see it as being of value. There's a very basic and very powerful economic law. In fact, it's an immutable law. And that is that people will exchange their money for that which they feel is of greater value than the money they're exchanging it for. Mm-hmm. Makes complete sense. Complete sense. And what I like is your next law as well that really hit home for me when I started to live my passion, which is Savvy Central Radio itself, and that is the law of authenticity. Often we end up doing things we think will make us more money that's more profitable that we should or could have done, you know, because that's what the family or the society says. But I think you really start to hit success in your life when you can really live the law of authenticity. Tell us about that one. Sure. Well, the law of authenticity says the most value, and this ties right into what you just said, the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. Mm -hmm. One of the mentors in the story, it was a little later in the story, Deborah Davenport shared with her audience because her lesson was in the form of a uh, presentation. And she shared that early in her sales career, she learned a very important lesson. And that is that all the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, even people skills, as important as they are, Christina, they are also all for naught if you don't come at it from your true authentic core. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do, when you, what I like to say, show up as yourself day after day, week after week, month after month. People feel good about you. They know you. They like you. They trust you. They want to see you succeed. They want to be a part of your, your life. They feel comfortable with you, I think, probably because of the consistency of your nature. I mean, when you're authentic, you're also consistent. I think it sort of goes back to what Gandhi so brilliantly said when he defined integrity as when everything you think and everything you feel and everything you say and everything you do are in alignment. Mm. It brings up a question, and I think this is a very important question, and that is, well, so if authenticity is you know, so helpful to one who wants to be successful, why doesn't everyone show up in their authenticity? And I think the default answer most of us would have is, well, because they're trying to be phony or trying to pull one over on us or they're naturally dishonest. I, certainly there are people like that. I mean, it's a big world, so there's, there's all types. But most of the time, I, I don't think that's the case at all. I think what happens, Christina, is a lot of people really just don't have the self-confidence and understanding of the true value they bring to the table. And when that's the case, when you don't think that you're uh, that you have much value to offer, it's, it's hard to show up as authentic. <laughs> you don't see a benefit in that. And that's what Deborah had to discover. She had to discover the value she brought to the table. Now, I believe that most people, uh, as human beings, I would say we all have two types of value. Mm -hmm. One would be intrinsic value. Just by being born, we bring value to the equation. But 
There's also what I call market value. And I define market value as those strengths, traits, and talents that you bring to the marketplace that, that allows you to bring value to the marketplace for which you'll be financially rewarded. And different people have different strengths, talents, what have you. Some people are great when it comes to numbers. Some are wonderful problem solvers. Some people are terrific resources. Others are great connectors. Some are wonderful, empathetic listeners. Some, you know, different people have different, different strengths. What's key is to understand those strengths and why they're of value. Because what happens is human beings, we're so close to ourselves emotionally, obviously, that it's difficult for us to see why this thing that we have is of value. Example, mm -hmm. I've mentored and coached people. And I mean, I know you're a very successful coach and mentor, and, and I'm sure you've had the same basic conversation with people where I've asked them what they're doing and they've, they've told me and it was something really significant. And I, and I went, wow, that's wonderful. That's awesome. Their immediate response was, oh, no, no, everybody knows that. <laughs> or, you know, everybody does that. And they weren't being falsely modest in any way. They simply didn't understand that what they had was so special. You've got to ask why. And I think it's a couple of reasons. One is whether this talent they have is natural to them. So they don't remember. We tend to think that as we think, everyone else thinks. Mm -hmm. As we are, everyone else's. That's based on our belief systems. And, and so we think, well, we do this. Everybody does this. So obviously, I can do it and everybody else can do it. But whether this talent or trait or characteristic, whether you come by it naturally or whether you put in your 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, Anders Ericsson uh, discussed in his famous uh, report, uh, his famous research that Gladwell talked about in 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. Mm -hmm. Gladwell talked about it in Outliers. Sean Colvin, Jeffrey Colvin rather, talked about it in Talent is Overrated. Typically, it's a combination of both. You're typically naturally good at something and you've put in all that time. And when you've done that, it's so natural to you that you fail to see how special it is. So I advise people, make sure before anything else, you both understand the value that you bring to the table in terms of your unique strengths, and also what you offer is valued by your customers and clients. And when you know that, now you can match the two of those together. Mm, good distinction there at the end, to add that. Because you could say, oh, I love this. I'm going to shove this to people. I know everyone's going to want it. But it might not be something that a value that people want at the moment. It's not something that they desire or have a demand for. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that brings us to the last law, the law of receptivity. Yeah, the law of receptivity says that the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. Late in the story, uh, Pindar, the main mentor, asks Joe to breathe out and hold that breath to the count of 30. Joe tries, but in, in short time, he runs out of air. He's gasping for breath. And Pindar says, what's the matter, Joe? Can't do it. And, and Joe says, no, I can't just breathe out. I've also got to breathe in. So Pindar jokingly says, well, Joe, what if I was to tell you it's been medically proven that it's actually healthier to breathe out than it is to breathe in? <laughs> Joe laughs, yeah, of course, and he, he says, but that, that's silly. You know, you, you, you've got to, you can't do one or the other. You've got to do both. Well, of course, absolutely, you've got to do both. Just like the tide rolls out and it rolls back in and it rolls out and it rolls back in and it rolls out. We breathe out, we breathe in, we breathe out, we breathe in, right? It, it's not either or, it's both. We breathe out carbon dioxide, we breathe in oxygen. We breathe out, which is giving. We breathe in, which is receiving. Mm -hmm. I think what happens, and I think this is just such a shame, Christina, and, and again, this is because of the way we've been programmed really through society, but through all its various uh, media and so forth. But we really, we most people see giving and receiving as two opposite concepts, when in actuality, Giving and receiving are simply two sides of the very same coin, and they work in tandem. Really, to focus on just one side of the equation while trying to minimize the other is really an exercise in futility, because first, 
every giving is made possible only because on some level it's also got to be a receiving. And every receiving is made possible because it also has to be a giving. The other thing is if you, all the giving in the world, and again, when we talk about giving, we're talking in terms of giving value to the marketplace, giving value to others. Yeah. All the giving in the world is great. It's, it's wonderful, but it's also all for naught if you are not willing to allow yourself to receive in like measure. Because what you'll do is you'll stop the flow. You'll stop the natural universal flow of give and receive back and forth and so forth. And so what happens is when when people find that they give great value to many people, they put others' interests first, they're totally authentic in what they do, and yet they don't allow themselves to receive, it's due to a really a, an unhealthy relationship with money. Mm -hmm. About 99 times out of 100, it's on an unconscious level. We don't even know it's there. It's sort of like that the main part of the iceberg is under the water. We don't see it. We don't know it. And when you don't know something, when you're not aware of it, it's awfully hard to improve in that, that area. But you think of it, it makes sense that because of, again, the messages that people get about money through a combination of upbringing, environment, schooling, mm -hmm. news media, television shows, movies, where the messages are such lack. Uh, there's all the stories about, you know, the, the people who get wealthy do it on the backs of others. Not You, you very rarely see a movie or TV show, documentary or news report about the fact that that especially in a free market-based economy, the only way somebody makes money is by providing value to others. Mm -hmm. um, again, in the free market. Now, if somebody's robbing a bank, that's different. If somebody's buying influence from government in order to create a situation where they have an unfair wealth, well, that's another thing, but that's not the free market. In a free market-based economy where nobody is forced to buy from anyone else, the only way you can get wealthy is by providing value to others. But we don't see that. That's not a message that we are exposed to. And so we've got to understand that if we've got these messages inside our head that money is evil or only crooks are wealthy and blah, 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 that's going to hurt us. That's going to hurt our ability to provide value to others and to, to receive what we've earned. Mm. I love this whole topic. Uh, you know, I think the key, once we get past that money issue, is simply to understand that, again, it's not are you a giver or a receiver. It's not an or, it's an and. You're a giver and a receiver. However, the key goes back to what we first talked about, focus. You've got to focus on the giving of value. Focus on the giving and then allow the receiving. Great. Awesome distinction. And I really loved you bringing in the, the part about the money because money, many of us have a, a kind of skewed story about money due to society, family, you name it. And I was one of them. And it's very interesting that you mentioned this because early on, I thought to be a taker was wrong. Giver is good. And I was often known as a super generous person. I love the title. But when I started a business, it started to conflict my idea of, oh, you've only got to be a receiver, not a taker and get a full year's worth of free consultations. And, and I soon realized towards the end of the year, I had this one gal give me a call and I helped her out for a good hour on the phone. And a month later, I checked in with her to see if she used any of my suggestions and applied them to her business. And lo and behold, she didn't do any of it. No, she didn't value it because exactly. of the money. And she didn't pay for it. And it's, and it's natural. And we've all, I think, gone through that. Mm -hmm. So it was an awesome lesson. I'm hoping others out there will begin to realize if they're having difficulty as well and not receiving, able to receive, maybe look at their money story and see if that might be a hindrance to their to their progress. Exactly. Awesome. Your teachings really break down some of the old paradigms about sales. What are some of the paradigms that are broken down in this book compared to the old models of sales? John and I thought it was very important since there is, you know, a focus on sales that, that people need to have an understanding of what sales is and, and just as importantly what it isn't. Because if you if you, you base your logic on a false premise then you can never reach a, 
a correct conclusion. So, so you know, we first let's set the premise about what selling isn't and what it is, because selling has a bad reputation as a profession, which is due in part to salespeople <laughs> not doing it correctly, but it's also due in part to the con artists out there. And many people look at con artists and salespeople as being the same, but they're not. And so, and so let's understand that we need to make sure we understand the difference and why being a salesperson is, is righteous in the first place. Because it's only when you believe in what you're doing that you're going to allow yourself to do it correctly and put yourself in the, the to create the environment to be able to receive. So many people think selling is about trying to convince someone to buy something they don't want or need. Mm. In reality, selling is just the opposite. It's finding out what someone does want or need and, and helping them to get it. Some people think selling is about taking advantage of others. Just the opposite. That's being a con artist. Mm -hmm. Professional <laughs> selling is about bringing more advantage to people through your products or services. Perhaps, though, the biggest upside-down misperception of all, Christina, about selling is that at its essence, it's about taking when in actuality, now we love receiving, mm -hmm. but not mm -hmm. taking. Taking would, would imply that you haven't provided value first. And so, but again, it's just the opposite. Selling at its core, at its finest, at its most profitable is actually all about giving. And I mean that literally. And, and someone might say, well, no, Bob, you mean that figuratively that it's about giving. And I'm just going to say, no, it's literally about giving. Why? Because the old English root of the word sell was salan, which meant to give. So when you're selling, you're literally giving. Now, someone might say, well, wait a second, you trick us. You know, that's not, <laughs> I get it, but that's not, you know, what are you really giving when you're selling? And this is where I would be very serious because I would say, think about it. Imagine you are in a selling environment, a selling context, a prospect in front of you, and you're in the sales interview. OK, what exactly are you giving when you're selling? I suggest you're giving time, attention, counsel, education, empathy, and mostly value. Mm -hmm. So when you're selling, you are literally giving and you should be proud of that. Mm. I love this, Bob, because this early on brought me to my wonderful mentor, Deborah Burnt, who got me on the phone doing cold calls at first to get me comfortable with talking to people and doing that sales call. Uh -huh. And it was like the hardest thing I've ever done. It was horrible. And I hated it because I felt I was taking people's time. I felt how horrible. I never liked those people that give me a call. But after doing it several times and we sat down, we went through the process and what I was feeling, I realized what I couldn't see at the time was my value as a person, what I had to give to people, as we talked about earlier, that some people don't have the confidence. They don't see that the talents and gifts that they were born with can serve the world and add value to the world. Mm -hmm. And once I could see that, yes, I indeed have something of value to offer, then the whole sales call changed to what I'm taking from them to what I could give to them during the call. That's wonderful. In other words, what you did is you took the focus off yourself and you exactly. put it on them. I mean, that's, that's what a great, great example. Exactly. So I really, really love, love, love this topic. And I'm guessing a lot of people out there are totally confused what the go-giver really means, what the term means. What would you say to them who are confusing the title and, and really don't get what it means? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot, that's a great question. I think a lot of people, they, they again, they look at the title, the go-giver, and they assume <laughs> it's, it's not about making a profit or something. No, go-givers make a great profit. It's that they understand that the profit is a result of the value they're providing. That's the key. So to, you know, associate, you know, they, they may think it, again, give yourself away. Nothing like that at all. Most go-givers, they typically charge higher prices than others. You know, remember, when you try to make low price your unique selling proposition, first, it's not unique at all. And unless you're a Walmart, it's probably not going to be very successful. When you sell on price, you're a commodity. When you sell on value, you're a resource. And go-givers tend to be positioned as resources. So no, go-givers make a great profit, but they do that by giving much more in use value than what they take in payment. 
The other thing is many people, I think, believe that a go-giver, being a go-giver means you've got to be, you've got to say yes to everybody. You've got to be at people's beck and call. You can't say no. Or you're not a go-giver. And that, of course, is totally not correct. In fact, the, the more of a go-giver you are, the busier you're going to probably be because the more successful you are and you're going to have to tell more people no. The key is that a go-giver would, would tell someone no in a way that communicates respect and communicates that they value that other person and they would be tactful and they would be kind. Can I give you an example? Yes, go for it. Well, so many people have a tough time saying no. And there's nothing wrong with admitting that because it, hopefully we're nice people and we're, we like to please people. There's nothing wrong with that. That's very human. The problem becomes when that overtakes your ability to stay true to your own, what's the correct word I'm looking for, boundaries. And so what happens is we, we feel like we can't just say no, so we've got to fib. You know, so let's say somebody asks you to serve on a committee. And for whatever reason it is, it's a personal reason. You don't, you don't want to do it. It's just not something you choose to do. And so people might think, well, when they're asked so they don't hurt the person's feelings, they've got to say, well, I would, but I'm, I'm really busy. Well, there are a couple of problems with that. One, you're kind of fibbing uh, because you're not, it's not really because you're busy. It's because you don't value being on that committee as much as you value not being on that committee because you mm -hmm. just would rather not do it. Mm -hmm. And so when you fib, you kind of don't feel good with yourself because you don't feel you're being congruent and authentic. So that's the first thing. The second challenge with that fib is that pretty much they've heard that before and they know how to answer it. And when they show you, when they overcome that objection and show you why it's not going to take up much time and how you could do it if you really would, and it's so important. Well, then what happens is now you've got to either admit to them that you were fibbing, which is going to make them resent you and it's going to make you resent you, or mm -hmm. you're going to have to, in order to save face, you're going to have to join that committee, which you don't want to join. So you have not honored your own boundaries and now you feel lousy about yourself. Instead... Let's say no a different way. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've heard the politically correct kind of new thing, and that is, uh, and I've heard Oprah say this, and I've heard other people say this at seminars, and they'll say, no is a complete sentence, you know, and, and everybody nods their heads in empowerment, and oh, yeah, okay, I, really, is that what you're going to do? Are you going to just rudely say no to somebody, uh, you know, first of all, offend that person? possibly uh, hurt other opportunities that could come up, and most importantly, act out of congruence with your desire to be kind to others? I don't think so. So, no, you don't have to be rude and just say no, and you don't have to fib. What you do is very simply, when they ask you, let's say, to serve in that committee, you say, oh, thank you so much. While it's not something I'd like to do, please know how honored I am to be asked. Mm, I love that. Now, let's say they, some people will still try anyway. They'll try to maybe guilt you into it and they'll say, oh, but it won't take much time and we really need you. What you do is you just, you show no emotion other than kindness, but no defensiveness. And you simply say, oh, I appreciate it. I'd rather not, but thank you so much for thinking of me. Boom. That's it. And they will get the message that no means no, but you're doing it in such a nice, kind way they can't possibly be offended. They'll also know that from now on when they ask you something that if you want to do, I mean, there's a time to say yes, too. But mm -hmm. that if the answer is no, it's no, but there's never a challenge with it. Mm. Go-giver would handle it. Oh, that is fabulous. I love that because how many times have we been in a difficult position, either with family or friends even, where you just don't want to tell them, this isn't going to work for me. It's not in my, it's not in my best interest and therefore exactly. not going to be in the best interest for you. Exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for that ex example. That's great. My pleasure. So, you know what I was really curious about and I really was fascinated about is the law of left field. That was really fascinating to me. Can you tell our audience a little bit about that? Sure. Well, the law of left field is not its own law. It's not a six law. It's actually a mini law or sub law within the greater law of receptivity. And the law of left field simply says the greatest gifts will come to you at moments and from places you least expect. 
Now, why, what does that really mean and, and how does it work? Well, when living our lives and conducting business according to these principles, all sorts of value showers down upon us from sort of that, that unnoticed, unseen place. Uh, examples, you find, you suddenly find a critical lead, you receive a great referral, or you make a crucial last minute connection that turns into a hugely profitable new client. A golden opportunity drops suddenly into your lap or, or some incalculably valuable thing comes your way, but not from the people or places you might have expected or even hoped. Uh, in fact, if, my, if you're a baseball fan, you might, might have even said to yourself, wow, that one came right out of left field. <laughs> now, uh, here's the thing. When living with a what we might call a giving spirit, which again means focused on creating value for others, great value comes to you suddenly and unexpectedly and in amounts often far greater than what anybody owes you. But here's the thing, and this is this is so important, but so vitally important, I think, to understand. And that is there's absolutely nothing mystical, there's nothing magical about this. Uh, you can't know exactly where these gifts will come from, only because you can't know exactly where your influence is spread. But spread it has. You've planted so many seeds of goodwill, great will. So many people know you, like you, trust you, who want to see you succeed, want to be a part of your, your life that the world has become what we call one of a, a benevolent context for success. And while you can't necessarily see its operation, there is indeed cause and effect. The cause is giving, the effect receiving. Now, everyone listening can take advantage, can tap into this law within a greater law, both for the benefit of others as well as their own. How? Well, find new, more, better, creative ways to give more in value than they take in payment. Touch the lives of more and more people with the exceptional value they provide. Continue to increase and expand your influence uh, through your willingness to place other people's interests first. Stay congruent with your true authentic core. And again, realize that just like breathing out and breathing in, giving and receiving are simply two sides of the very same coin. And as long as you focus on the value, on you know, get on the giving and allow the receiving, you will receive the abundance you deserve. Uh, you'll receive an abundance of friendship, of love. You'll receive an abundance of money, of new business. And sometimes, Christina, that new business will come from right in front of your eyes. And other times, it will come from from out of nowhere. You know, from way out of left field, right? <laughs> Seemingly out of nowhere, but in reality, out of everywhere because it really comes from the gravitational pull of your influence. Mm, I love this. Thank you so much, Bob. This has been fabulous. Please let our audience know where they can find your wonderful book. And you have more than one book. You have a total of four books, correct? Yeah, we have a few out there and a new one coming out in late October. So we're pretty excited about everything. Uh, they can just come to Berg. My website's Berg and that's spelled B-U-R-G dot com. While they're there, they can subscribe to my Influence and Success Insights. And I would suggest they do this because they're going to get some really, really great value-based information. They can also check out my blog. They can connect with me through social media. And they can download Chapter 1 of The Go-Giver if they'd like to see if they like how the story starts. Uh, you are such a go-giver yourself. Thank you so much, Bob, for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom today. Before we leave, is there any final thoughts you'd like to leave with our audience? Well, I think it's just, you know, when you have something that you want to do, when you have a desire, seek out, find out the information. That's why a coach like you, Christina, is so important to people. And so seek out, find that information, apply the information, be persistent, get past the no's. The only thing about no's that are discouraging is, is thinking you're the only one that gets them. But you're not. It's just a part of success. As, as my friends Richard Andrea Fenton and Richard Waltz, who authored a great book called Go For No, goforno.com, they authored a great book. Uh, and their premise is, yes is the destination, no is how you get there. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and then, you know, have belief in yourself and your mission, what you're doing and the value you're providing others. And when you have all of that, you're going to be unstoppable. 
I love it. Unstoppable. And I love your mention there about the nose as just getting to the yes. That it's as some people would see the nose as failure, but indeed not. Failures in even in itself are lessons to your greater goal and success. Exactly. Well, thank you, Bob. It's been awesome having you today on Savvy Central Radio. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom. My honor and my pleasure, my friend. Tune in this Monday, September 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern, where our guest will be Patricia St. John, foremost nonverbal communication expert.